Thank you, uh, Gautam. That was brilliant. Actually, if you're the Luke Skywalker, I'll be, I'll be more of the Darth Vader <laughs> when I talk about Mexico City. Uh, and I, I want to put some things in perspective. We're close to an 80% urbanized country, but not only are we a, f a highly urbanized country, we're a, a, a country of very large cities. We have a, over 11 cities, over 1 million inhabitants, 53% in metropolitan regions. And um, the primacy of Mexico City is that one out of five people live in, uh, in the metropolitan uh, region of Mexico City. When we compare this to places like uh, Ethiopia, and in particular Addis, there's a big shift in what we can learn or what we can talk about when we talk about the problems of housing. So it actually, if we look at the history of housing in Mexico, we'll notice that it was in the 1950s that it had the precise same population that Addis Abeba has today. So maybe by looking at those moments, those mistakes, those solutions, we can say something meaningful or useful or not to what, how can we address the question of housing in a place like Africa. I, I kept thinking about this idea of uh, the moving go, uh, goalpost. The challenges and the solutions in Mexico, as in elsewhere, the same could be said about London or Paris or New York City, are always shifting. So there's no one solution or one, one fit solution that can resolve the question. That's why I'm talking about four episodes in the history of urban housing in Mexico that can maybe give us certain approaches of how we frame the question and how the solution was resolved. The first episode is from 1946 or mid-century to 1972. Housing is used as a social political project of modernity. For those of you who watched Los Olvidados by Luis Buñuel, the forgotten ones, the problem of modernity is what we do with the forgotten ones, in these cases, the urban poor. And housing became a tool to address the question of being forgotten. First by the large scale projects by people like Mario Pani, and the first projects of multifamily, the equivalent of what uh, um, what uh, it was called as a, as a condos uh, earlier on, but this, this model of housing, on the two hand, tried to, to allow for a solution for a, a growing uh, economy and a growing country, but at the same time to connect it to a broader agent, uh, agenda of, uh, of, uh, uh, of modernity. It is no accident that when uh, John F. F. Kennedy came to Mexico City in 1962, the, he was taking not to one, but to actually two different social housing projects. And actually, in his discourse, He's actually talking about the architects and talking about the social housing project. I don't remember, and I don't know if uh, whenever a dignitary comes in 10 years to, uh, to a place like Addis, he will be talking about Lagar in the same way that Kennedy was talking about these social housing projects. I am curious about how we connect those notions of housing as a political uh, project to the question of housing and what does it do. The moment of, of, of uh, the high point of this, uh, this stage happens with the Tlatelolco. 13 housing units brought uh, in 1963, but it is happening exactly at the same point that informality is taking the biggest stronghold. Ciudad Neza, the paradigm of informality in Mexico, 1.5 million. This is happening at the same time that uh, Mario Pani is doing 13,000 units of housing. So what does that do? The second project is what I called housing as institutionalized finance. In 1972, the, the structure of, uh, of housing creation and in particular housing finance becomes organized as, uh, around this, uh, the Infonavit, which is a national workers housing institute. It is no minor accident that they call it workers housing. It is in that definition, different from housing from the, to the poor or the olvidados, that there is already a definition of how it could work. The model of Infonavit is, is, based, is basically a, a large mortgage bank, the fourth largest in the world by portfolio size, but it works through a contribution by the employers that works both as a, a savings for housing, but also as a retirement fund. What this system was able to do from 1972 to 1990s was to provide both construction finance and the structural uh, organization at the level of governance of how housing should be produced. What happened in the mid-1990s, and let's, uh, let's not uh, forget the kind of the backlash of the neoliberal uh, governments all over, is that 
this, this pact between the private sector, government, and community and residents at some point uh, collapsed or begin, begin to, began to show its cracks. Finance had a, the, the finance of Infonavit had incredible uh, um, uh, unpayable uh, uh, mortgages. So that's where the moment that the, the government begins to deregulate. And this leads us to the third stage from the 1990s to 2012, deregulation and massive housing. So it goes back, and I've heard the word massive so many times today that I'm scared every time I hear massive. Uh, because massive for us, uh, knowing in hindsight, is not a virtue, it's actually a problem. And maybe we should take it with a grain of salt. At this point, and similar to what Gautam was saying, there was a strong emphasis on home ownership. So there was a legalization of uh, people occupying public lands. But this produced millions of housing on the peripheries, which uh, in 2008, meant almost 800,000 mortgages given out by, uh, uh, by banks, including the, the Infonavit, in every year, and provided a, a crisis. A crisis on the one hand of, uh, of the model of housing, abandoned housing. The new government who's coming in in two days in Mexico is talking about five million abandoned housing. The, problem, the numbers will probably be closer to between one million and two million, but still to have one million abandoned housings is morally uh, unacceptable. The second aspect is that most of the housing companies that produce this housing collapse. Because if your model of business, and keep in mind that this is deregulated, it is privately built affordable housing. If your model is buying cheap land and then selling it when you have abandoned housing, you crash. So this, this leads us to the fourth moment, the idea that we should move from massive housing to quality and urban relevance, from housing policy to an expanded urban agenda. And this is where the question of new, uh, all, de all, the, all developers begin to adjust to the new norms, a new, more, uh, uh, sort of a more demanding market, but at the same time, a new set of policies from the, from the administrations. These are projects, and just to compare, this, uh, this is a housing project we worked in Mexico City. These are 500 units per hectare. So it's a fairly high dense uh, environment, even talking about three and four story walk-ups, which is something that Rahul mentioned earlier. And um, when uh, the other policy happened to, uh, to be implemented by the Sedatu or the territorial secretary, when we look at the expansion of Mexican cities over the time, we see an incredible gap between the amount of population that grew. Mexico City grew in 30 years 1.5 or 1.4 times, while, while the size of the city moved 3.57. When we, if we moved to Querétaro, it was from 3.39 to 16.12. And in the case of Toluca, 3.41 times increase in population, but 27 times increase in urban size. This is unsustainable as it relates to an urban model. So the policy was to implement a series of polygons which contained urban growth. And to actually, and, and, and uh, Jean-Louis Misica was talking about coercive actions. It was more about uh, incentives. So you would not get a subsidy uh, or your, the, the buyer of your house would not get a subsidy unless you would operate in these different polygons. Um, the, uh, another set of policies implemented by the Infonavit, in particular by Carlos Cedillo, who leads the, the Research uh, Institute for Sustainable uh, Housing, means that, uh, um, as Gautam was mentioning, we should understand that growth of housing should not be seen as units. So one policy was uh, to build one more room. When you have a housing stocks in the tens of millions, to build one unit can actually change the, the, the way that housing is perceived. Another model is to actually to do assisted self-built housing, but not only focusing on, this, uh, on the slumber generations of cities, but actually do it in places where assisted uh, um, uh, techniques can help, such as in the, in, the, in the marginal and rural communities. The third is the best practices to actually inform the housing production ecosystem. This is a housing award-winning project by Alberto Calach. By connecting good architects, good housing projects with the developers, you're able to change the dynamic. And finally, uh, the idea of improving the housing state, the idea that you have a huge housing, uh, number of housing units that require investment over time, 10, 20, and five, even five years after time. The most impressive project of this is by Rosana Montiel, by called Common Unity, also a very awarded project. So very quickly, five possible lessons for African cities, tentative. One is the idea that we and you need to define what affordable housing means for you, for your city. Who does it serve and what does it do? 
It is not the same to do housing for the upper level of the, of the, of the wage segment. And it is not the same to do housing in the peripheries of Addis uh, uh, as it to do in another place. Which leads me to the second point. Differentiation matters. Climate, material, size, scale, and typology. Whether you're doing, uh, this is a Longata court next to Kibera in Nairobi, or whether you're doing, again, the peripheries in Bole, or you're doing housing, abandoned housing, which was mentioned uh, earlier by Misika, in a place like Axum, or, uh, or this type of housing in La Libela, differ, the way that we differentiate the policies will matter. Uh, we have to think about affordability beyond housing ownership. When we look at the way uh, that uh, GDP relates to housing ownership, there's no clear correlation. You can have uh, countries on different sides of the equation having low ownership with, uh, with, uh, with rentals. Uh, we need to expand the urban agenda to address questions of mobility, economic development, inequality, and we visited some possibilities yesterday. And finally, this idea, of leapfrogging. The, do not repeat the mistakes other countries and cities have made before you. The great Wolfgang Novak, with whom this project would have never come through, be talked about the grammar of success. Yesterday we were saying that never underestimate the power of stupidity and failures. It is a virus that can get replicated. If you're doing the same mistakes we did 50 years ago, uh, I think it's not a good solution. Thank you very much. So, Jose, just to be clear, what's the one thing that you've gone through in your country for the last 40 years, dealing with similar issues but 40 years ago, what's the one thing that you would caution, let's say, the decision makers in this city or some of the other cities not to do? I would, act I would actually steal the word from, uh, from Rahul about disaggregation. You should not think about, about massive housing in terms of massive projects. One thing is the scale, the broad scale of projects to do 50,000 units a year or 500,000 units a year as we do. The other idea is to do 50 projects of 1,000 uh, units or 10,000 units. It's a, I think that we have to disaggregate the massive. And how do you respond to Gautam's challenge in many ways that one has to, in a different context, where there's a lot of, I'm going to use self-build as a sort of a metaphor of what you were talking about, that you need a different planning framework. When I was first invited to the Urban Ages Conference, as I was in Gautam's position defending the, the retrofitting and the informal, uh, now I've become kind of an evil empire. <laughs> the Darth Vader. I, the Darth Vader. But I, I do think that we have to stop seeing the, the informal formal as a zero-sum game. And, um, and in the same way that the planning protocols have to be reimagined and, uh, and reframed. So uh, stop seeing this as a zero-sum game. Just to, just to follow up, uh, you spoke about uh, the abandoned, uh, the million or so abandoned houses uh, across Mexico City. Uh, could you talk about why that's actually happened? Because, uh, be, 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 because clearly the question is not about uh, an inability to deliver scale, it's about something else, so what is it that actually... Um, Three reasons, one yeah. of them is quite dramatic. Mm -hmm. Out of the 56 million affiliates to Infonavit, there's a percentage close to 50% that even if given a mortgage, just by their economic condition, they will not be able to repay it. Mm -hmm. So it's a trap. Yeah. The second is when you build housing three hours away from jobs, and opportunities, you are condemning two people to inequality. At some point, people rather give away their uh, house, lose their mortgage, and move and rent back in the city. And third, it goes back. When you understand housing as a real estate market, your concern is giving out mortgages. Building square meters is not about anything else beyond the sheltering. So this collapse, this crisis means uh, just allocating mortgages and building square meters very far away. That's, that, that's a great place to end. Uh, we're going to just throw quickly to Kesia. I think there's a really interesting set of connections between what you are saying and some of the work that she's doing. So, uh, Kesia, rest. <laughs>